Hey everybody, I'm MS Farzan, and welcome to this video on learning the basics of Unity Multiplayer Networking with Mirror. If you've been following along with my series on learning C Sharp and Unity for digital tabletop game development, this video will be a great entry point for learning the basics of networking so that you can tackle my tutorial on making a 2D multiplayer card game with Unity and Mirror. If you're coming to this video for, from someplace else, it'll still be a great entry point for using Mirror to add multiplayer functionality to your games. Let's get started. My objective for this video is to expose you to several of the high-level concepts of using Mirror for Unity Multiplayer. And you're from, if you're wondering what Mirror is and why we're using it, the reason why is because uh, at the time of recording of this video, Unity doesn't have a built-in first-party multiplayer solution for its games. And I know what you're thinking, that sounds totally crazy, that there's nothing that Unity supports natively in terms of um, multiplayer networking functionality. It used to have this thing called Unet, and that's been deprecated, and there's something else in the works, and none of us know what that is, and it's super frustrating. But um, coming to our rescue are several third-party uh, solutions, and Mirror is one of them that is pretty well supported and um, it is I think actually a fork of UNET meaning that uh, there is some documentation out there about UNET, UNET's um, deprecated um, uh, functionality and you can sometimes refer to that documentation if you're not able to figure out what you're uh, doing in Mirror although Mirror does have documentation of its own. If you go to the website, which is at mirror-networking.com, you can learn more about Mirror and specifically this um, guide section where the documentation is can be helpful to look through so that you understand how their high-level API works and uh, some of the things that we'll be talking about in this video. Uh, we'll refer to this to the concepts on this website several times. If you've been working with Unity at all, either through my tutorials or uh, by yourself, a lot of these concepts will feel very, very foreign and um, strange uh, as they did to me when I started using them. So I think it might be helpful just to have a primer before we dive into other videos or tutorials um, about um, actually putting these things to use. So the first thing we'll need to do, um, and if you're coming to this video from somewhere else, I should probably explain to you what we have here. We have just a very simple scene uh, with a few scripts that allow us to uh, play a game um, well, not much of a game really, just a little demo where when we play the game, we click on this deal cards uh, button and we get a bunch of, well, not exactly cards, but we get tokens that are rendered on the screen uh, programmatically. Um, these tokens live as um, just a prefab in this token prefab and we're able to drag and drop them around the screen like we would for a board game or potentially a card game or some, some other tabletop game. Just a, a 2D um, a 2D game of some kind. There's not much to see in the hierarchy um, or really it's just this one token prefab that has an event trigger on it that um, allows us to do work when um, there's an event where we start dragging or stop dragging one of the tokens. There's only one scene in the in the game. And um, we have a few scripts. Uh, one of them is a debug script that, that doesn't really do much. Um, it's something that we used at the beginning of our tutorials. We have a draw card script, a drag drop script, and a game manager script. And I'm going to um, sh just highlight those um, so that you see what we're doing with them. First, with the, um, well, let's start with the drag, uh, the draw card script, which lives um, attached to the button. It uh, simply finds the, the game manager script um, or the game, game manager object in our scene and it grabs the game manager script that's attached to it um, by uh, getting a component. And when uh, we click on it, it um, uh, when we click on the button, it calls the game manager dot create tokens uh, function uh, or custom method that we've written. If we go to that game manager script, we see that um, all it does is it takes uh, two public game objects, which are the token and the canvas. Um, it, uh, it, um, the create tokens uh, method takes a, um, a parameter of number of tokens, how many tokens you want to generate. And we just created a dummy Boolean to say that if some arbitrary um, Boolean or condition is true, then um, we will loop over this code block to uh, create 
uh, um, a number of tokens on screen or to instantiate a number of tokens um, that is specified in our draw card script. Nothing really that special here. Our drag drop script, um, uh, as you would imagine, allows us to drag and drop uh, tokens around the screen. If you're interested in how we came up with this, you can feel free to uh, dig into uh, the um, uh, series that I've put out on uh, learning C Sharp and Unity for digital tabletop uh, um, games, uh, 2D games, um, or uh, the series on uh, how to create a 2D uh, multiplayer card game in Unity. Both of those will cover these, these basics. What's more important here is to understand that we have everything working in this game um, as a single player demo of a game. We need to, with Mirror, think about how we would do that with uh, multiple players because uh, we want to be able to have a way of signifying that when you do something in your game, whether it's on a local area network or you're across the country or in a different country than I am and we're um, uh, connecting over the internet, we're going to need to uh, create scripts and prefabs that are um, will be accessible in some way by both clients or both um, machines, um, both games that are running on separate machines. Um, and the way that this is normally organized is through what's called a server-client relationship. Oftentimes, you'll have a, a remote server that just lives somewhere. It could be in a um, in a uh, database farm somewhere in the middle of uh, uh, in the middle of nowhere, or it could be, you know, a, a computer, a Linux uh, computer that you have set up in your house um, that acts as a server. And um, then the client, or um, uh, let's say my game window, when I open it up, that will be one client. It'll connect to that server, and so will yours. And then will the server will handle when things uh, appear on screen, or um, what rules um, will govern our gameplay together, and that sort of thing. Um, the way what we're going to look at right now is less of a server-client relationship, and what's called a host-client relationship, um, also known as peer-to-peer -peer networking, meaning that. One of our clients, I have this client running here on my computer, and your client, one, one of those clients is going to act at the ho as the host, meaning that we don't need a separate server. Um, either my client or your client, let's say it's mine, is going to act as a host, meaning it's going to be both a server and a client, so that I don't need to have a server running somewhere um, else or um, uh, pay someone to host a server service for me. I can have that running on my computer and be a client at the same time. So when you have a server and a client that are um, uh, both running on the same machine, you can call that a host, and then the other person would just be a client. And that's the way that we're going to structure our application. What we need to do first is go to the Asset Store and um, you'll probably have to sign up for a Unity account if you haven't already. And We're going to search for Mirror And we see that we have this mirror networking. Um, I, or you can check it out in the asset store. I already have um, it uh, uh, installed on uh, some of my projects, and it's one of my the assets that I've um, connected to my account. So I'm just going to write. Um, well, let me go to my asset so you can see that. Um, and you see that I have it here. You can just click on it and say that I want to import it in my scene. Uh, and in fact, let me update it because I might have an older version. And um, if you have an older version uh, or a newer version or a different version, that might make a few things different than what we're doing uh, today. For example, I'm using Unity 2019.2.15 F1 Personal. If you have a newer version of Unity, some of the things we're doing or the user interface might look different. And that's similar if you're using, I'm now I'm using version 16.1.1 um, released on June 14th of this year, uh, 2020. Of mirror. If you're using a different version of mirror, some of these things might be a little bit different. So I'm going to click on import so that I can use this package in my in my scene, and I want to import all of these things. It'll download it to my machine, which might take some time. And um, you might notice also, um, this is not my favorite thing, but when you go to the documentation on Mirror, 
uh, and look at some of the things that they've written here for you. Um, some of these features are either deprecated or they work a bit differently now than when this documentation was written, which I really, um, you know, take issue with uh, because uh, a lot of people, myself included, depend on this documentation to make things work. Um, the benefit, um, or I guess the flip side, is that if you join the Mirror Discord server, they're super helpful in, and responsive in helping you um, iron out issues, particularly if there are things that you're trying to do that are um, that might seem simple, but you just can't get them to work. So you might try that as well. Okay, I've imported it into my into my scene. And I can see that I have this mirror folder down here. If you feel like poking around here, you can go into the editors, um, sorry, the examples uh, folder, and you can look at a Pong example, um, look at the scripts, how they've uh, set things up. You can look at a chat example, um, a, a tanks example, if you want to create a room. Um, all of this stuff is here for you to play around with. And I think it's it's useful to look at how uh, Mirror themselves, how they um, do things um, to give you an idea of how you might be able to do things. Now that we have that installed, the first thing that we're um, going to be exposed to, it's what's um, called a player. In Mirror, there is a, um, the, ob the server is um, going to privilege an object um, in your, uh, in your scene that's called the player. Um, if you follow other tutorials on Mirror, there are a couple of good ones that I will um, link in the description of this video. You'll see that if you have a, uh, let's say a two player top down spaceship game and you have a, uh, one of those spaceships is um, uh, gonna be representing your player and another spaceship is gonna be representing my player. Each of those player objects is gonna be privileged by the, um, uh, by the mirror system in a number of ways. The first one is right here on the on the hierarchy. I'm going to create a new game object and I'm going to call this a network manager. And I'm going to add a component and I'm going to um, uh, add a network manager component, which you can see it in my screen. It might be a little bit small. It has the little blue mirror um, icon next to it. it. Just means that I've correctly imported mirror into my scene, and I'm able to use the components that um, comes along that come along with that package. I'm going to add the network manager to it, um, and I'm also going to add a network manager heads up display to it. We'll see what that does. Um, and if I look at this network manager uh, component that I've attached to the network manager um, object, we'll see um, within it, there, well, there's a lot of stuff in it, but the most important part here is this player prefab. The player prefab is, um, is expecting to receive some sort of prefab that um, the network manager can spawn into the scene for us and handle a lot of the logic that a player would do. Like if um, my player is represented by a spaceship on my scene, I want that player object to be able to uh, shoot lasers, um, to take damage, to uh, avoid missiles, you know, that sort of thing. And so if you're making a tabletop game like we're doing here, um, you might not have this a similar concept of what a player prefab is, but you'll still want to create a player pre prefab that will be able to um, handle the scripts that Mirror will, will be expecting. We'll do that in this video. Um, another, another note is that um, if you've been working with Unity, you might be uh, comfortable with the nomenclature of instantiating an object or creating an object in your scene, perhaps from a prefab. Um, the way that Mirror represents this across a server is called spawning. So when you create an object, um, if you instantiate it, you're just creating it locally here in one client. But if you want to um, create it for all clients from the server, that's called spawning. So we'll be using that nomenclature in this video. So our first thing to do here is in the prefab, we're going to create a... Um, well, we can just create it here in the hierarchy. Create an empty game object. Call the player manager. We'll drag it to our prefabs and we can now delete it from our scene. 
click on the network manager to find the, the hierarchy, and we'll drag the player manager over to the player prefab. Uh, and we get an error that says, player prefab must have a network identity. That's a great idea, <laughs> a great reminder that we need to add, if we just search for um, under components, network identity that um, is a component that mirror requires everything that's going to be synced, every object that's going to be synced over the network is going to need a network identity. So that's a good reminder for us. We click back on the network manager, drag the player manager over to the player prefab, and then we see this little check mark that we want the network manager to auto create the player every time when the game runs for the first time. There are some um, specifics about uh, like um, if you want them to be spawned randomly or round robin. Um, uh, that's not my field of expertise. I would say like if you're trying to make um, uh, a two D shoot 'em up game or uh, even or even like a three D game um, where like an MMO type thing and you want people to spawn in a, diff in a different way, you'll have to look up another tutorial to to figure out how to do um, that to match your specifications. We're just going to be looking over the basics in in this uh, video. And then right under here, the player object, we also see a registered spawnable, spawnable prefabs list. That means if you want the network manager or the server to spawn things um, for you um, across clients, you need to register them here so that the server is able to access them at runtime. You, uh, we're just going to create a plus here and go to our token and add a component. We need a network identity. And we also need a network transform. And if I add a network transform, just a little shortcut, it will also add a network identity for me. The network transform is uh, specific to objects that you, you want to have a transform or some sort of visual representation on the screen. I don't need that for my player manager. Um, I uh, um, don't have an actual player in the scene um, in this tabletop version of the game, but I do need it for uh, uh, my tokens that are going to be put on the screen because I want all clients to be able to see visual representations of those tokens. Go back to my network manager and drag the token over to this um, spawnable prefabs, and you can add as, ma as many of these as you like. I think within reason. I'm not, I'm not sure if you wanted to spawn 2,000 prefabs, what that would look like, but you know, at least 10 should be fine. <laughs> All right, very good. Okay, so let's go to this player manager. Let's add a component and let's call it a player, um, well, script. Let's add a new script and we'll call that script player manager. And we'll add it. Okay. And let's, uh, because I like to keep things tidy, I'm just going to move this player manager script into my scripts folder. And let's open the player manager script. And we'll get to see some of the specifics of um, how the actual scripting works in um, using Mirror. So when I look at my player manager script, it doesn't really have anything. And the first things that I need to do um, is I need to add to this the namespaces up here. If you're not familiar with namespaces, it's just um, collections of code or libraries that uh, we draw from to add functionality into um, our code. Uh, for example, we're using system.collections, system.collections.generic, and uh, Unity Engine. We need to add another namespace, a new one, called using mirror, so we can use all the code that comes along with mirror. And usually our scripts uh, in a single player scenario for Unity derive from um, what's called mono behavior, which is the base class for Unity. If I um, mouse over this, mono behavior is the base class from which every Unity script derives. We need to change that to network behavior, which uh, is um, specific to what we're working with when we work with uh, Mirror. And our player manager is going to be um, somewhat of a source of truth for all of our uh, uh, programming moving forward when it comes to our um, networking with Mirror. 
we and it can be a little bit convoluted in this case because we're not having separate scripts for servers and clients. We need to write our uh, scripts here, particularly the player manager script, um, in a way that the that Unity can access it and determine how to behave, whether we're the host, meaning a server and client, or if we're just a client. And there are some tools that are available through Mirror that help us to accomplish that goal. Just want you to think about, we need one script to rule them all, all basically. We need one script that uh, allows us to um, have our client act both as a server and a client or just as a client. Um, there are a few things to be aware of um, from the get-go. The first thing is that um, there are a uh, series of what are called callbacks, network callbacks that we can use um, to help us accomplish certain things. For example, um, if I go to the um, uh, network behavior section of the documentation. We see um, there are uh, mm, a number of uh, callbacks that are listed here. For example, on start server, on stop server, on start client, on stop client, uh, so on and so forth. So if we need certain things to happen, like when the server starts, we need um, uh, a deck of cards to be shuffled. Um, that would be a good time to do it. Or when a client, um, on start client, when a um, client uh, uh, is loaded, we need certain things to happen on screen. Or um, uh, there's also, uh, th those are the callbacks. There are also, um, let's see, where's the, um, let's see, network manager callbacks. There's another um, uh, section here, like when the client starts, you want um, uh, something to happen when the client connects. They uh, are able to receive a message that welcomes them. Or uh, when a client disconnects, you want everyone else to get a message that says they disconnected. Um, those are what your callbacks would do. And the way that you would use a callback, for example, is you would say, uh, public override void on start server override void on start server and it will if you're using the unity workload with visual studio uh, it will autofill for you this base dot on start server which basically means that um, we're deriving from uh, another script here uh, in network behavior, and there already exists an on start server method, and we want to override that method first by using the base code that's in the on start server method, and then whatever it else we want to do here. So I could just say debug.log server started within my code. And now it'll run whatever on start server um, is already packaged with mirror and also my additional code that um, logs that the server started. Let's see how that works um, in, in practice. You might think, okay, I'm used to editing my code and then playing the scene, which actually works just fine here. I hit play and um, what might be kind of tiny on your screen is that before, we just had the deal cards button here. Now, because we've added the um, heads up display to the uh, the network manager here, the network manager HUD, it also adds this heads up display, which allows me to click on this top button, which says host server plus client, or just as a client with a field for me to determine where my what port I should be listening on, or if I just wanna be a server only. I'm gonna click on host, and then my scene will actually load. And if I look at my console, I'll see that the server started and um, I get the message that I asked when the, uh, for the server to post when the, um, or to log to the console when it starts, it says server started. That means my network callback has worked um, properly. You could do this if you're um, using a network callback when the client connects or when the client starts, any number of those things. So 
our usual workflow is not going to be that we just like play a game and you know we're done. We actually need to uh, create two clients on our machine where um, th that can com communicate with one another. And to do that, we actually need to build our client. That means that um, I'll need to go to File, Build Settings, and make sure that my sample scene or whatever scene you're using is um, is included in these, this field that says Scenes in Build. Just make sure that it's checked. You can click Build or Build and Run. What I like to do is when I'm in the scene, just hit Control B and you'll have to create a new folder. Let's just um, create a new folder here that's called Build. Select that folder and we won't have to do that every time, just the first time. And when we hit Control B, what will happen is the uh, that Unity will build a play playable version of the game for us as though like we were ready to distribute it. And once it does that, we'll get this pop-up that says Made with Unity. And we have this game working. I'm going to Alt-Tab over into my Unity scene. I'm going to hit Play. And now I have two clients running on the same machine. One of them I'm going to select as the host, and the other one I'm going to select as a client. And now I can see in my, my console that you know everything's working just fine. If I click Deal Cards, I get um, these uh, six tokens on my screen, and I get six tokens if I play Deal Cards on this other screen. So both clients are working normally. The problem here is that these um, these cards are only being displayed uh, locally. So I can't see, let's say this is your scene, I can't see your cards in my scene and you can't see mine. We'll go into that much more in depth in my uh, series on how to build a 2D card game with Unity I um, and Mirror. Uh, what I want you to just um, kind of think about is how um, although these uh, tokens are being instantiated in one scene, they're not communicating over the network in any way, and that's what Mirror helps us to do. So I'll stop this and I'll close this scene. And let's work through some of the things that you'll be dealing with when you're, um, when you're working with Mirror. The first thing that I might want to do is um, well let's say that when I uh, when I draw these cards when I click draw cards in my scene I want them to appear in both scenes well okay the first thing that I might think of is that um, it might be good for rather uh, than having my client handle the um, instantiation of the cards in or the tokens in my scene or yours it might be better to have the server handle all of that and spawn them across all clients or clients as necessary um, not only because uh, we want the server to handle every, everything for us but also because that would be a great way to prevent cheating so I can't just like um, create cards at, at will if I'm good at hacking into the unity client um, and uh, instead I have a server handle it for me so let's figure out how we would do that. Well, let's go into our um, scripts here. And let's move, uh, let's go into our game manager script. And just for now, let's copy and paste this create tokens um, code block into our player manager. Can delete the update section of our code because we won't need it. I've post posted it here, pasted it here, and I'm going to change it a little bit. And I'm going to just say that it doesn't take a uh, any parameters. It doesn't require a boolean. Just just really basic. And what it's going to say in this create tokens. Um, uh, method is uh, there's a for loop that loops um, over this block of code five times 
and um, at the top of our because we want um, as we've seen in previous videos and you if, if you're not um, familiar with this uh, it's uh, the reason that why we're doing um, when we have the canvas here is because when we instantiate things on the screen in the mirror um, in the unity canvas um, uh, 10 times out of 10, they won't be parented correctly uh, under the main canvas. They'll be parented outside the main canvas or not in the right place. And so you won't, actually won't see them on the screen because they're um, they're behind the canvas. So we just parent it to the canvas. It's not really that important in terms of it's uh, if you're not working on a tabletop game like we are here. But um, we're saying we're, um, well, we want to find the main canvas and then um, we're creating a private game object which is called token and we want to instantiate it um, uh, uh, programmatically um, with no rotation we want to get the uh, debug script which we don't actually need to do here so I'm just going to delete this line we want to get the component um, the transform component on that token and set the parent of it to the canvas.transform and um, and we don't want the world position to stay where it was. We want it to be parented to the canvas at the locations that we've um, indicated in the in the code. So to make this work in this particular script, I need to declare a public game object token and a um, public game object canvas all right and because I've done that I know where what that token is going to be so I'm going to um, go into my prefabs find my player manager drag this token prefab over here so that I can use it cool and then now I have this um, I have all the pieces together the only thing else that I need to change is my um, draw cards really should be called draw tokens um, script and I'm going to add these lines that we did here uh, previously and say we're using mirror as a namespace and this draw card script is deriving from network behavior and we're going to change this and we're going to say public player manager player manager so we're grabbing the player manager instead of the the game manager and when somebody clicks we want to run player manager dot uh, create tokens with no um, no arguments now here's a curious thing that you'll need to be aware of when you're working with mirror in uh, this, in the example that we've used previously, we've had this game manager where we just find it um, as you would anything else in a Unity scene. Um, we want to find something called game manager in our hierarchy and grab the game manager component. Because of the networking um, that is performed by Mirror, uh, you can have some wonkiness when you're trying to find a player manager in your screen. It might not be able to find the exact player manager that you're looking for. We want to find the player manager that has been spawned by the network manager. And the way we do that is we can save a, um, a variable called network identity, and we'll just call it net ID for short, equals network client dot connection dot identity. And then our player manager is equal to network ID or net ID dot get component player manager. We don't need this game manager reference. And that's the way, I mean, you could just string all this together. You don't have to create the netID uh, variable, but um, this is just a clean way of doing it. And that this is the way of saying that, like, I, I want to get the player manager component that's attached to the actual network client that exists right now that has been spawned by, um, by the server. 
Um, and I've seen some wonkiness when you try to uh, find this player manager at different points, whether it's in your start method or on start server, on start client. So I like to just find it right before I need it here in the on click method. I just put it right on top of everything. So, you know, every time you click, it's going to find that. It's, you know, doesn't really require all that much performance, and it just ensures that I'm going to find the player manager um, in my client that um, I need to work with every time. Okay, so now that's all connected. I should probably go into my scene, find this button, add a uh, network transform, which will also add a network identity, save it as a prefab, and delete it from my scene, and then find the network manager and add it as a um, spawnable prefab. so that we can use it. Okay. Let's see. Let's give this a go. See what happens. I select that I'm working as a host. And what I don't see is the button. And that's because I've deleted it from my scene for no reason. And I hit deal cards, and I still see them on my scene. Well, I see five of them. I should have written six, but that's okay. So it's still existing in my scene. What would happen if I uh, used this uh, code and uh, built the game again to create another client is that it would still appear in my scene. The, the player manager is handling it, but I haven't told the server that I want it to appear on the other person's screen as well. Let's see how we do that. When we go back into our player manager script, and I'm going to change this to six so we have six tokens on the screen. Um, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to begin to work with what are called commands and uh, remote procedure calls. If we look in the communication section um, of the documentation and remote actions, um, there are these two things um, called commands and remote procedure calls. A command is something that a server, I'm sorry, a client will send to the server and request for the server to do. Whereas a, a remote procedure call or a client RPC um, is something that the server requests for all clients or in some cases, specific clients to do. When you see this client RPC, that just means the server is requesting for all clients to, to perform an action. When you see a command, that means a specific client is asking the server to perform an action. You can also work with target RPCs if you're looking to target a specific client and not all clients. We won't be um, dealing with that in this tutorial. Just know that it's there if you need it. So what we're going to do here is we're instead of just having this um, this uh, create tokens method, we're going to add a tag here in between these brackets called command. That's required when you're creating a command in uh, Mirror, and it's also required that you preface the um, the name of the method with the letter CMD. CMD create tokens. Now uh, Mirror will recognize that I'm attempting to run a command here. So now the server is going to handle this rather than just a local client. And uh, within this um, section, I'm, uh, I'm going to remove just a couple of parts and place them outside of this code block because we need to do them elsewhere. So just save this for later, the part where we're finding the canvas and we're trying to get a component on the token. Just comment this out for now. We just want to run this, this loop here.
So uh, we're instantiating each of these game objects um, within our for loop in this command create tokens. And then what we need to do here to make them uh, um, visible across uh, the across all clients is say network server dot spawn token comma connection to client and uh, this mouse over is actually pretty helpful it says this spawns an object like network server dot spawn but also assigns client authority to the specified client um, and uh, this is a little bit of a shortcut that we're using. There are two things to note here. Um, in this network server dot spawn uh, method, we're passing in two arguments. One is token, which basically says uh, we've instantiated this token on our client. Now we want to uh, spawn it. We want the network server to spawn it. Um, that's what the first argument is. And then we're assigning the authority of it to the connection to the client. Before we go any further, um, we need to discuss what authority is as it's integral to the process of um, learning how to use Mirror. I'm gonna move over to the documentation just so you can see um, that there is a section on authority, um, which, you can, uh, which I highly recommend that you read and learn about. What it means is that the, uh, well, just the first sentence here, it says um, servers and clients can both manage a game's object, game object's behavior. The concept of authority refers to how and where a game object is managed. The default state of authority in network games using mirrors is that the server has authority over all game objects which do not resent, represent players. So when a server spawns an object, it has authority over it and um, essentially has authority for most things in your game scene, which means that it can perform certain things um, to that object that nothing else can. If um, we assign authority to a client, that means that client is able to perform those operations on that game object, whereas other um, clients aren't able to. So if you think of like a massively multiplayer online game or even just a multiplayer RPG where like I uh, am a player and I have a backpack and a bunch of stuff in my inventory. I want that player object or that player prefab to be the only person that has authority over those objects and be able to complete actions on them. Um, I don't want other players to be able to, um, or if they're able to, there has to be some sort of handshake between the client and the server to make that possible. And this concept of authority is what we're gonna use uh, throughout our journey with Mirror. So it's good to be um, aware of it now. So in this network server spawn, I'm saying um, uh, segment, I'm saying I want the network server to spawn a token and I want it to assign the authority of um, uh, assign the authority of that object to the client that um, is requesting it to be spawned. Which is great. Let's just run this as it is without building the scene. We'll hit play. Uh, let's see, we get an error. Player manager does not create a definition for create tokens and, oh, I see. I am uh, uh, in my draw cards script. I'm asking it to create tokens, but I haven't changed this to command create tokens. So we should do that. Save everything, hit play. Play as the host, deal cards. And okay, that's great. It's actually working, even though it's not appeared on the screen. Um, it has spawned the the objects, but what it has done is that um, it is not it is no longer uh, parenting those objects to the canvas, which we want it to do. It's parenting them outside of the canvas, so we can't actually see them on our screen. But they do exist in our in our scene. That's actually pretty great. What we need to do to make that work is create a remote procedure call, uh, a client RPC, which you'll recall is what the server requests all clients to do. So here, we'll, uh, below this code, we'll add a client RPC tag, and below it we'll say public void RPC show tokens, create a new uh, method or function and um, just like the command you need to have the client RPC tag as well as begin um, the first three letters of your uh, method name should be uh, capital R and then lowercase PC RPC show tokens 
we'll move this reference into the client RPC area or code block. And we're just going to say um, that the RPC uh, show tokens, it will take a game object token as a um, parameter. And um, this uh, canvas, well, well, like we did with the player manager, we'll just find it here. We could um, we could do it like in our on start client. Um, I found that to, to work um, sometimes. Um, Mira, I found to be a little bit finicky about the start cycle and when things happen when. So sometimes it's just easier to find your main canvas here. Um, or if you need to find things like we did with the player manager in the draw card script, just find it when you need them. Um, let's see what we've called this. We've called it the main canvas, so that should work. And in the RPC show tokens, we're saying when uh, this token appears, we want it to um, to we want to find the main canvas in the local client, and we want the um, we want to get the component um, of the token, uh, the transform component, and set its parent to the transform the canvas transform, and keep its world position. Um, so we say. Um, oh, don't keep its world position, sorry. Uh, move it to, to where we've asked it to be. Save this. And um, the only thing we haven't done, we haven't called this, uh, this remote PC seizure call, which we'll do right after, our, after we spawn the token. We'll say RPC show tokens, and we'll pass in this token that we've created. Okay, save it. Press play. Start as a host deal cards and we see that um, these tokens have been corrected correctly appearing um, are now correctly appearing on the screen and they've been parented to the main canvas by the remote procedure call if for example I hit control B and build the game do 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 just wait for it to build and I'll play the game here in Unity and hit host plus server, uh, server plus client, and then one of them will be just a client. When I click deal cards, it uh, my cards appear in both scenes. Um, and the reason why is because the host, which is acting as the server and the client, has um, spawned all of these cards or tokens um, uh, across all clients and then has run a remote procedure call to have the clients to um, uh, display them on the screen. That's pretty cool. Let's look at uh, one more thing. Let's look at authority in action. So let's say that um, in this client RPC, so the client, um, the server is requesting all clients to perform this remote procedure call. When we, um, when we receive that remote procedure call as a client. If I press the button, then uh, because of this command where we've asked the network server to, to spawn the token um, and um, give authority to the client that spawned it, then I should have authority over those um, objects or those tokens, and you should not, and vice versa. So when I say if, in parentheses, has authority, which is a, a boolean that determines whether or not the object has, um, well, well, I'll just let Mirror do the talking. This returns true if the object is the authoritative version of the object in the distributed network application. Okay, that's actually not that helpful. Um, I'm just saying like, if I have authority, if this client has authority over the object, do a thing, otherwise do something else. Um, a pretty simple thing that we can do here is we can just debug.log. We have authority. And leave things as they are. And here in the, um, if we don't have authority, we could say debug log. We don't have authority. That's pretty simple. And perhaps 
uh, we can change the color of the object. So we'll say token dot get component image dot um, we want to get the color of the image, which actually is going to require for us to add a namespace here using unity dot uh, unity engine dot UI. Okay, so get component image dot color um, equals color dot magenta. So basically, um, get the image component attached to the token and find the color and change it to magenta if we don't have authority. Now I'll hit play. Oops, no, not yet. Too soon. Hit control B to build it. And wait. And hit play. And now I'll start as the host and you can play as the client. And when I hit deal cards, I get these um, white tokens and um, I get a no notification from the re remote procedure call that we have authority. Whereas um, this client, um, because of the remote procedure call, um, demonstrates that it does not have authority, all of these things have turned to magenta. Um, we're not able to see the, the, the um, debug uh, console uh, being logged to in this uh, version of the build, but there's a way of doing that that you'll see if you watch my other video series on um, creating a 2D card game. But we could, for example, stop this client and stop this host. Um, and instead, we can have you play as the host and yes, you're allowed to do that. And I'll play as the client. And now when you click deal cards, you see the white cards. I see the purple cards and it says we don't have authority. Um, so I know that that's working properly. And that's how you can manage certain things to determine who's able to uh, move the cards around the screen, who's able to uh, perform certain actions, and uh, authority can be really useful. It can get a little hairy in your, um, your player manager script because with this script, as you'll recall, um, we have to think not only are we playing as a server uh, or as a host, meaning the server and the client, but we're also, this is the same script that's gonna serve as our client script. So you might have to compartmentalize some of this code or if you need um, just the server to do something, to do a, um, a method, you could write server right above it, a server tag, or um, if you need to check on something, you could also say if, um, is server or um, if is oops this is not working let me let me do this within a, a, a code block so that it works better if is server or is server if it's only a server or is client only um, there are different ways that you can write your conditioner conditional logic um, to help segment out how things are supposed to work in your scripts. If you have a very complex game or a very robust game, it might be better just to go for the server plus client plus client or, um, architecture, meaning you have a dedicated server and clients that connect to it, rather than having a host and client relationship because that just might be an easier cognitive way, way to separate things out and, and make it more make it make more sense for you. But if you're just doing the peer-to-peer -peer relationship as we're working with here, you'll have um, all of your code in here uh, and your um, conditional logic built around whether or not the, um, the uh, client that you're working with has authority over the objects that have been spawned for you by the server. Um, one other note is that uh, you, you'll definitely want to look through this uh, these guides here on mirror networking. And I highly recommend um, looking into uh, three things. One is the start cycle uh, that um, is determines when things happen, when um, the, the client, uh, when the server starts, when the client starts, when um, authority is established, that sort, sort of thing. There are some great tutorials. Um, out there that I will um, 
I will attempt to a link in the description of the uh, this video if I can find them. And um, if you're doing anything that requires uh, you to work with specific clients, you want to look at um, understanding the uh, in in depth the net IDs that are associated with those clients and with um, uh, each object, so that you can do things like um, what do we talk about in remote actions the um, the uh, target RPCs if you want specific clients to to have specific actions rather than all clients um, in your remote procedure calls. And um, it may also be useful to look at, uh, well, obviously the game objects when you're spawning players and spawning objects, it's good to, to know a little bit more about that. Although we did look um, we did look at that um, quite a bit in our tutorial here. Um, and also synchronization. If you need things to be synced across the network, like uh, a player's hit points or an enemy's hit points or whatever, um, Mirror provides tools such as sync variables, sync events, sync lists, and so on and so forth. I haven't used them extensively because they, they really haven't met the needs of what I've been looking for in my tabletop games. For example, um, I tried to use sync variables to do some, some work for me in um, keeping track of numbers and public variables. It just didn't work out for me the way that I wanted it to, but it might be helpful for you, and there certainly are tutorials out there that um, look at um, state synchronization um, across your mirror game, so that may, might be worth looking into. Otherwise, I think that does it for uh, for this tutorial. I hope this video has been helpful for you. If it has, please be sure to like it and subscribe to my channel. Um, you can also go back and review the uh, video series on learning C-sharp and Unity for digital tabletop game development. The next natural step is to um, take a look at my video series on um, how to build a 2D multiplayer card game in Unity. I think that will be um, uh, well worth your time if you're trying to make any type of multiplayer game and specifically a 2D tabletop game. And um, I'd love for your help in spreading the word about my books and games. Uh, you can do so by checking them out at entromancy.com or nightpathpub.com slash entromancy. And we'll see you soon.